months and uh, it's been breathtaking in many areas. I, I tell you that I probably could have spent another year on this particular subject just because there's so much that we didn't cover in antiquities and so many things that are recorded in history that uh, I didn't have time to cover concerning those things, but we still have some more to cover. We ended in Acts chapter 28 at the very last verse, and but today uh, there's a question that, did Paul go to Spain or not? And the reason I asked the question is because theologians think he did. Some theologians say, no, he died, but yet they have the book of Second Timothy written in about 67 A.D., which is about four or five years later after the imprisonment of Paul. Actually, he was imprisoned in 61 A.D., and he was only supposed to be there for two years, right? He waited two years. And then in 1 Timothy, which he wrote from his rented house, not a cell, and, and, and he wrote four Gospels while he was there, he made the statement, I'm going to be coming to you soon. And then he said he's going to winter out in a particular town. And I can tell you that there is evidence of writings from uh, progenitors after him that there is a possibility, more than a possibility, of a visitation and some tie-in of possibly some prophetic things which are, I'm going to say, I'm going to say on the cutting edge, did that happen or did that happen? Did not happen, you know? But how, how can we know? Uh, Domitian, uh, Dolation, several of the uh, uh, emperors, when they really began to crunch down on Christians, they went into every church. They killed everybody they could find. They burnt down all the churches. They took all the archives of letters and antiquities, and they destroyed everything that was concerning Christians. There was a real, real turndown of uh, hostility against Christians from the Roman Empire. And I, I, I've got my little twinkie thing here, and I want to take you through some slides maybe to start off with, because we're still with Rome. If you'll kill the lights, we're still in Rome. And uh, there's some key phrases I want you to keep in mind. Uh, uh, the outer reaches of the world, or uttermost parts of the world that was referred to by Jesus. Well, in the Roman Empire, in all of their reference points, they referred to this as the uttermost parts of the world. And when they, there was also the declaration that was continually made of uh, farthest west of the empire. Farthest west meant Spain over here because it was the furthest point sticking out west, but the furthest part of their empire of the world was Britannia right here. And you notice this, uh, this, 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 Hibernia here? Uh, what does that say underneath? The Scots. They referred to Ireland as the Scots. Can you imagine that? Now, I got some weird stuff that I'm going to have to go through and just tell you because there's all forms of references out there that Jesus made. What, what do we do with the phrase when Jesus made the statement that the gospel was to be also preached to the lost sheep of Israel. What does that mean? Have you thought about that? You remember him saying that? He made the statement, the gospel is supposed to be preached to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, I'm not going to make a huge case out of this because there's plenty of people out there that do. But it does merit some interest. He's in Israel, and we know the tribes are there, or do we? See, that's one of the things. When the Assyrian Empire, some thousand years earlier, uh, maybe 800 years earlier, came in and ransacked Jerusalem, Darius was the guy that did it, there was part of Israel that was split off and never returned according to the antiquities, both in the Babylonian history, Assyrian history, Jerusalem history, of a couple of tribes not being returned. What do we do with those two tribes that weren't returned? Because there was only ten tribes that were returned 
to to this area. And and these these are different uh, anomalies that we find in history. So was Jesus referring to the lost uh, uh, tribes? Because there's all kinds of antiquities about the lost tribes. And what it's talking about, there was 12 tribes. Well, two tribes evidently didn't return according to most antiquities. And it's questionable even in the other theologians' department of, well, we don't know. That's all they'll say. But yet in um, so many of the prophecies, it talked about the tribes being dispersed. They literally were carried off afar. And many of those tribes, I've seen maps that many, oh, back up here. I've seen maps that uh, show them being moved up into this area and then another tribe being moved as far as up into this area right here. Now, whether it was a whole tribe or not or just part of the tribes, we don't know. But there is some things in antiquities that some of that tribe actually was planted here. Matter of fact, uh, in, in the historical records and in prophecy, it said that the gospel is going to be preached on the mountain of Lud. Well, the mountain of Lud is uh, the Lud Hill that is there in London. So <clears throat> there is, and we're going to be looking at whether I don't know its authenticity. I, I, I can't state that uh, that. The Acts chapter 29 that was found in the 1700s is actually a, a book of the Bible. We, we don't know that. However, it is consistent in some of the things that Paul would have been doing. It, it, it would be consistent with fulfilling some of the prophecy that it was supposed to be preached, the gospel was supposed to be preached to the uttermost parts of the world. It would be consistent that in England itself, there was churches that were there before the Catholics ever went there to evangelize. So what do we do with that? I want to deal with Paul in Rome and give you some things. This is a, this is a Roman Empire and all of its provinces. Remember I told you it's like the United States. These are its states and all the different provinces of those states. And there was like 53 different ones that were part of the Roman Empire. And you can see there was a wall that was built that was right here because these people out here, they never could tame. It was in about 43 A.D. that the Romans finally conquered Britain. And as a result, they couldn't handle these wild barbarians up here coming down and killing them. And so they, they used the slave labor that they captured here and put a wall there so that they could not uh, uh, keep raiding into England itself. Some historians believe that, uh, that from this section of the area, one of the descendants of Noah, he was on ships. That it says that he lived on ships and his family lived on ships. I think some of his descendants had come around here to settle Ireland and perhaps they had navigated over here. Some biblical theologians think that some of the lost tribes ended up here. And the reason being is because there was some stone that they crowned kings with that was found in Scotland, which was in Ireland. And that stone came from the, from the uh, Middle East area uh, from the same time that the Israelis were, were excommunicated from their property and carried off to somewhere else. And part of them weren't carried off. Part, the two of the tribes escaped going down into Egypt because they, had, they, had, they were going to fight with the Egyptians against the Babylonians. Well, the Egyptians got crushed and Israel got crushed and those two tribes were supposed to have left in ships on their own, not as slaves, and circulated out. Now, all this is speculation. I want to know that we're speculating this, this, this little prairie dog to death here. But there's so much writings about it and so much antiquities and so much in the history books of people having met Paul, Paul having preached. And matter of fact, the street that he preached upon, there's a chapel that's built there in England. And 
some of the antiquities, like in First Clement, it says, uh, though, envy, though envy Paul to show by example the prize that is given to the, to the patients, seven times was he cast into change, and he was banished, and he was stoned. And having become a herald both in the east and the west, he obtained a noble renown due to his faith. And having preached righteousness in the whole world, and having come to the extremities of the west, and having borne the witness before rulers, and having departed at length out of the world, and went to the holy place, and having become the greatest example. Clemens Clement is re, is referring to the West of, of being in of him being in Spain here. Now, there's also uh, writings. Uh, uh, there's additional writings by him, and I I don't want to go too much into those. But it seems like every one of the guys that were connected to him are referencing uh, him going to Spain him in Spain, him having preached the gospel in Spain and to outer parts. Now, these are all traditions, and when I say traditions, Clement was one that came along after Paul and did some writing. Uh, there was uh, Christomomus, which was, he had something to do with the homilies concerning Second Timothy. He did some writings about that. But in that, he stated in homily number 10, he said, for after he had been in Rome, he returned to Spain. Now, if he returned to Spain, that means he's gone back a second time, right? And, but whether he came thence again into these parts were not known. They didn't know if he came a third time. Cyril of Jerusalem, which he was one of the leaders of the church there in Jerusalem, in a lecture he gave, in lecture 17.26, he said, From Jerusalem and even unto Ilium to fulfill the preaching of the gospel and instructed even in imperial Rome and carried the earnestness of his preaching as far as Spain, undergoing conflicts and innumerable and performing signs and wonders. Now there was a huge, from what I read in antiquities, there was a huge response in Spain, almost as great as the response that happened in Ephesus about wherever he went. There was all kinds of miracles that were taking place. And uh, some of the readings that I've looked at uh, have him uh, here in Rome and then with the possibility of him going back to Corinth and then back to Crete, and uh, back to Cyprus, and then catching a ship from there and wintering out in Napolis, which is right here. And that would have been in 63 AD, and after the winter of that, uh, he allegedly went back to Rome, and from Rome caught a ship and went into the coast of Spain, and then began to circulate all around Spain and come up back up through here and caught a ship into Britain. And from Britain, he was, it says he went back into Belgium, and, and according to some of the antiquities, and from Belgium, uh, he's on a trip, he's on a return trip now, and it was like a one year trip. Uh, on the return trip, he caught a tr uh, ship back and ended up in which France was split up into two parts. Uh, Belgium was right in this part right here. Or Belgianese is what the Romans called it. And he caught a ship from there and went from there back up into. He's on his he's on his journey back down into uh, uh, Ephesus and uh, that area. But, and so he's, he's cutting across land, and he ends up in Switzerland. There are signs that he was at the Lake Lucerne, in, according to some of the antiquities. Now, he's still on his trip, and as he's returning, and I'm not saying this is a positive. I'm just telling you all the information I dug up. You're going to have to make up your own mind. We're going to read chapter 29 of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Acts and uh, I got some speculation in my heart. I'll be sharing that with you about what may or may not be so. But it seems like the, the you know how Luke accurately recorded what well, we went here and then we went here and we went here. Well, everything is lined up in this that way too. So before I do though, we want to get on and look. And again, we can see uh, the uh, the way it's split up. 
and the names of the different countries. Somebody asked me about all the different countries. They didn't stand at all the countries. And, well, it's just because they changed names. Well, there's Asia, and we don't call that Asia today. We call that Turkey today. There's Britannia, where Paul was told, don't go there. And so we're going to continue on. This is what the city of Rome looked like when it was started out. Uh, this was probably about 500 AD or BC, something like that. And this is another look at it as it was growing, and this would have been in the time of Paul where all the stuff was located. And this city was a huge city. It had over a million people in it. It had over 600,000 slaves that served the people in the city. And it was just an amazing, amazing place. Now, we can see this arena is where Charlton Heston was, and he ran around and remember the little cart that he was in there. Uh, there's, uh, this, this right here is an aqueduct bringing water in, and it's made out of brick, bringing it all the way into the Imperial Palace, which was right in this area here. Now, I want to go on. That's some of the antiquities and paintings that was made in the 1800s or 1700s about the place. This is what the streets actually looked like then. I mean, they have detailed models of everything from the antiquities of the maps of where all the buildings were and what they functioned as back then, which I, I think is pretty cool. And, and, of course, there was no shy amount of temples in this place. It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, the, the amount of temples that are in this place. And we're going to get a look at this a little bit later on. The, this is uh, the uh, Senate, as people would come in to the Senate, kind of what it looked like, and more architecture from there. This, this thing right here, it's the Pantheon. Uh, can you imagine? Uh, this thing is over 2,000 uh, years old. 2,000 years old, and it's still standing there. This is the inside of one of the Colosseums because they had multiple Colosseums in this city. And another temple outside of the Colosseum again, another picture of the Colosseum. Some of the ruins of some of the architecture that was left, so we, we, they know where everything was. And matter of fact, they've got maps from back then. And here is the actual forum itself right in the middle of the architecture of this. This would be uh, kind of like the courthouses. Here's where they would have more meetings. And you can see all the structures that are around, and each one of these structures had significant. This is a temple right here. This is a temple. These are temples here. This is a temple here. And each one of these temples are not only to the gods, but they're also to the Caesars. They, there was, they had temples built everywhere for themselves, in their minds, they were gods, and if no one wanted to worship them, they were put to death. And that's what the whole crux of the matter was about Christianity, is they would not surrender and bow a knee to Caesar, that they would not renounce God as God, because you had to put Caesar above every other god or die. And this is a Capitol Hill. This is a theater that's over here. This is the Colosseum. You can see it, uh, how magnificent it was and the buildings and the other structures that are around. Here's another temple that is right here in the middle of this right here. This is to the virgins. That's how it tells you how few virgins they had there in that city. <laughs> Uh, this, this is a, a gladiator training Colosseum that was right here next to the major Colosseum. And this up here, you, you, you know what this is right here? Uh, this is a whole set of baths. You remember the Roman baths? You see, the, the, all these places in here were the, the, each one of the emperors had their own baths. And even Agrippa had a special bathhouse here. His was smaller than the, than the emperor's. But that just tells you how much power, how much money Agrippa had to have a bathhouse that could house maybe have 300, 400 guests in. Some of these were arranged so that they could have as many as 5,000 guests in them. They were like major water theme parks <laughs> with the little umbrellas and lawn chairs, I'm sure. <laughs> this is another bathhouse that's back here. This is another bathhouse. And each one of those are different. The, the different emperors built these. And, and uh, here's the four of the emperors in the Temple Tarjan. Uh, this is the temple, Tar, uh, Tarjan was one of the emperors, and this was a temple to him. Oop, let me back up. 
And this is a statue of him riding a horse right here. And this is a, the, uh, a marketplace that he built. And this is another temple that he built right here on this side to the goddess Venus. And this is another temple that's right here. I mean, are, are you getting the message here? There's lots of temples. Unless you were certified and, and, and worshipped the Caesars as God, if you worshipped them as gods, then you could worship the other gods too. But you had to look at them as the premost gods. Cause, so now imagine Paul is here in the mix of this place somewhere. And you can, I'm just giving you different shots of just small sections of the city. I could have loaded you up with another 50 to 100 of these photos of how they have plotted out all the territory of this area and all the buildings that are encapsulated in it. Here we have another temple to Jupiter that's on this hill right here. And uh, uh, there's another temple to uh, one of the Caesars that's right here. And this, again, is the Charlton Heston scene. This is an area of the Baths of Nero. This is where his place... His, remember how big this thing was? This is, this is huge. And this is a huge swimming pool right here. And this is where Nero was coming and having his relaxing parties when Paul was uh, here in the city after they were to get through having the chariot races and all that stuff. This is another theater. They constantly had theater. We, you know, it's like we have the big screen down here, 10, 10 theater. Well, they had 10 real theaters here. <laughs> and 10 things playing at the same time, you know. <laughs> oh, what show are we going to go see, honey? I don't know. We're in a hurry. It's across town, you know. And, and again, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, another the temple right here to another one of the Caesars. And this aqueduct is coming in into the main imperial palace. The main imperial palace we'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, this was the stockyards right here, but there was another temple that was built right here. Can you believe that? Right next to the stockyards. And this is that, uh, uh, what we were looking at about the Charlton Heston thing. I forget what it's called. It's called the... Uh, Oh, excuse me, this is a temple of Hercules. How, how he got down here by the bullpen, I don't know. <laughs> but in one of the Hercules stories, he was supposed to have killed the bull with his bare hands. So that may be why he's down here next to the stockyards. And the Circus Maximus, that's what this is right here. Temple of Jupiter right here. And the Theater of Marcellius right here. In, is right here where the, this is, and and we we've, we've done all. That. You, you can see the the river, and the river had ships coming or boats coming up it, bringing cargo all the way from the ocean. This is a pretty good sized river, and all these are warehouses in there, warehouses. I mean, it's being shipped in. You would imagine the shipping capacity that had to take place to manage of uh, 1.6 million people located in this area. Now, funny thing is, you see that little white line there? That's also where the city main sewer line went out, right next to her old Hercules thing there. <laughs> I thought it was funny because everything downriver would be kind of contaminated. And can you imagine, there's an island out here. It's got two bridges going across it. And, of course, the whole city is, has a huge wall around it that's pushed on the outside. This right here is a mausoleum to Augustus. You remember we seen that in that first picture as you cross the bridge, cross one of the bridges, you see this mausoleum to Augusta. Now, before the mausoleum, before he was put in there, he was cremated. So they built a special altar that the god could be evaporated to the skies with nobody watching and pile that thing full of wood and put him in there. And afterwards, they scooped up the ashes and they brought over here and put, put old Augustus over there in that building. So, yeah, yeah, are, do they have a public work progress here program going on here? Now, this is the Imperial Palace. You see the Imperial Palace? It, it extends all the way over into this area right here, including all of this stuff here. Now, with the Imperial Palace, you remember Paul was allowed to rent a house. He was under the jurisdiction of Nero, which was staying and living right here. He had to be close by because one of the palace guards is taking care of him. They change the guards. All the time they change the guards. Some historians say every six hours that they would change the guard. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, of course, uh, here's Paul, and uh, this is him there. And this possibly is just a rendition of him in prison 
writing 2 Timothy in about 67 A.D. So we have him entering Rome in 61, released in 63, and him back in prison in 67. There's a lot of time that has gone by, and some theologians think that he made nearly five missionary journeys instead of just the three that we talk about. Now, with that in mind, I think that we're done with that. We can turn the lights back on. Now, sometime in the late 1700s, well, I'd like to give you some other references that uh, uh, in uh, towards the end of his captivity, he announces his coming in the book of Philemon 22 and to the Philippians in Philippians 2 and 23. He's telling him, I'm, I'm coming to you. So he knows he's fixed to be released. He does not seem to regard this visit as uh, immediate since he promises the Philippians to send them a messenger as soon as he learns about the issues about his trial and therefore uh, plans another journey before he returns to the east. But you remember, uh, he also made the statement that after he goes to Rome, he's going to go to Spain. And some of, in some of the antiquities, uh, we need to mention the testimony of Cyril of Jerusalem, which I've told you about. St. Epiphanes also refers to him going to Spain. St. Jerome refers to him going to Spain. St. Christmas Storm refers to him. The uh, Theodoret refers to him going there. And the well-known text of Clement out of Rome, which is, uh, there's this Montessori canon, which there was some scripture that's not in our Bible, but it was just letters going back and forth between the different churches. And since they weren't written by apostles, they're not in our Bible. There was one letter they found that was from Corinth that was allegedly going to Paul in Spain. They found some fragments of that. See, so that's reverse mail from a church mailing something to, like if you mailed a letter to Pastor John, it's not like him sending us a letter, is it? And it would not be credible enough to put in our, uh, it, it's a, just a totally different tune. Okay, so uh, after that we have the uh, Act uh, Palia, which those are some fragments of possible, uh, the trip that uh, uh, Paul took to Spain. Uh, somewhat questionable, that particular document is, in some theologians' mind, and I, I'm going to say most theologians' mind, uh, sometime in the late 1700s, before the 1800s, C.S. Simonini, which is a French man, uh, was on a trip to Turkey, and he published a copy of Simonini's travels in Turkey and Greece, and this was uh, during the time of uh, uh, Louis the uh, 16th, I think it is. And while he was there, uh, he, there was a copy of a manuscript that was found in the archives of, the, of Constantinople. Remember, Constantinople used to be kind of the capital where all the Christian archives was sent to, but the, the Islam people took that over and... Uh, they, and when he visited there, evidently he was quite an influential fellow, uh, he got the audience with the sultan and the sultan Abdul Ahmed, Abdul Ahmed uh, gave him a copy of this particular thing and, and just, you know, slipped it. Hey, you might enjoy this reading, you know. And he was traveling during the reign of Louis XVI, who reigned from 1774 to 1793. And then he published his travels about those things that took place in 17, uh, 1774 and 1793. Uh, now, think about it. This is a Frenchman. And what we're fixing to read has to do with England. And the French hated the English. The French were at war with the English on a constant basis. So why would a Frenchman be publishing something that would be honoring England rather than something that would be honoring his own homeland? Now, I'm just throwing in some factors for you because we're fixing to read this document. I'm going to call it a document because I'm not calling it scripture. 
Uh, and so what would have been his object in bringing this forth if it was not some form of legitimate document? How legitimate is yet to be found, and I don't think we'll find out until we stand before the Lord, but there's uh, all these churches that were established in Spain before anyone went there, and there's all these churches that were established in England. Now, with that, let's begin. I'm just going to read to you. And Paul, this is Acts chapter 29, And Paul, full of the blessings of Christ and abounding in the Spirit, departed out of Rome, determining to go into Spain. For he had, a long, he had for a long time proposed to journey that way and was minded also to get from where he was to, Brent, to Britain. For he had heard in Phoenicia that a certain children of Israel about the time of the Assyrian captivity had escaped by sea to the isles afar off, as spoken by the prophet Ezra and called by the Romans Britain. And the Lord, verse 3, And the Lord commanded the gospel to be preached far and hence to the Gentile nations and to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In Acts 9 and 15 is where Jesus made that statement. It was supposed to be preached to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Acts 9, 15 and Acts 22, 21. And no man hindered Paul, for he testified boldly of Jesus before the tribunes and among the people. And now, before the tribunes, you, you must realize Spain was one of the first provinces of Rome. It had such deep ties with Rome. It was conquered in about 200 B.C., and but it had deep ties with Rome before Rome made a decision to conquer it. And when they conquered it, it became a, a vast part of their empire. It was like their bread basket. It was like their oil basket and, and, and their wine basket. It was absolutely rich because of the great soil that was there, the great climate that was there, the amount of rain that they had there. Versus you get over into the Greek and the Roman areas, there's a lot of rock and stuff. Although they didn't have that over in Spain. They really had some soil where they could plant some forest and not forest, but orchards and trees and stuff like that. So there were tribunes here. There were Roman cities that were built here, just like the Roman cities that we looked at. I didn't get those for you because I had other things I wanted to show you in this session. So he took a certain brethren which abode with him at Rome, and they took shipping at Ostrium, and having their winds fair, they were brought safely to the haven of Spain. Ostrium is right there on the coast of Italy, and now they're over into Spain itself. And much of the people were gathered together from the towns and the villages in the hill country, for they had heard of the conver con conversions of the apostle and the many miracles which he had wrought. Now remember, Paul's been doing miracles for years now, for years he is known all over the world, even including Rome, of all the healings that have come out of him laying on of hands. And so it's no small thing. If they had some witch doctor from some island that had healed thousands of people, I promise you every sick person would be pushing in. They would be coming from all over. I don't know if you've ever been to Eureka Springs or not, but it's in Arkansas here in the United States. In the 1800s, uh, it was established that there were some springs there, and the Indians uh, called those healing springs or magic springs. And as a result, people with sickness in the East heard about it. There was a write-up in a newspaper, newspaper about all the special waters that were there and the healing pools and all that stuff. And overnight, that place grew to about 30,000 people. Everybody across the United States that was sick headed there. And they had one sick puppy of a place <laughs> with hundreds and hundreds of pools that people would come to and soak in because they were supposed to have some power of healing. I'm telling you, when you're sick and you, you don't have medicine and there's nothing to get rid of it, you'll just about do anything to change that situation. Uh, so Paul had a reputation that was known around the world by this time. It was no small thing when he came to town. And Paul preached mightily in Spain, and great multitudes believed and were converted, for they perceived he was an apostle sent from God. And they departed out of Spain, and Paul and his company. Now, I, I read some other antiquities about the course that they took. It was a loop going completely around Spain, and then coming back up to get on a boat to go across to Britain, 
And finding a ship in Amorica, sailing unto Britain, they were therein, and passing along the south coast, they reached a port called Raphius. Uh, this is the Roman name of Sandwich, which is uh, Sandwich, which is where Kent is there in England. Uh, in Saxon's time, there was still a standing in Sandwich, an old house called the House of the Apostles. And the tradition has it that Paul was one of the apostles there at that house. Now, when it was voiced abroad that the apostles had landed, this is verse 8, on their coast, great multitudes of the inhabitants met him, and they treated Paul with graciousness and courtesy. And he entered in in the east gate of the city and lodged in the house of a Hebrew and one of his own nation. And on the morrow he came and stood on the Mount of Lud. Remember, I told you about the Mount of Lud? That's Lud, Ludgate Hill. And that's, that's, that, that, that'd be at the intersection of Broadway and Ludlay Hill there in London, <laughs> where St. Paul Cathedral stands in London today. And the people thronged at the gate and assembled in the Broadway, and he preached Christ to them. In other words, he's right downtown London. No chapel has been built or church has been built. But it was called the Broadway for a reason. It was the main section of the city there in London. And London was not necessarily a small city at the time. And this is where the people would come congregate. And that's why it was called the Broadway. It, it would be like having 10 or 15 marketplaces in one place. It was just open-aired. And so that's where he's at. It's like a Billy Graham crusade. And, uh, and uh, he preached Christ to them, and they believed and the word they believed the word of the testimony in Jesus of Jesus and at even the holy spirit fell upon paul and he prophesied behold in the last days the god of peace shall dwell in the cities and the inhabitants thereof shall be numbered this first ever census this was the first ever census in england prophesied in the ancient manuscripts which was taken in 1801 in the seventh numbering of the people, what he's, he's continuing to prophesy, there was a quotation in there, uh, peace shall dwell in the cities and the inhabitants thereof shall be numbered, prophesying in this ancient... No, no. And the seventh numbering of the people of their eyes shall be opened. Uh, that had something to do with the antiquities of some of them possibly being kindred of the lost tribes. The rest of Israel had had a census taken of it, but these tribes had never had a census taken of them. Now, I'm not saying all of England is an extension of the tribes. Uh, I'm not even indicating that. I'm indicating there are some extension of the tribes there. Uh, and, shall be, uh, uh, and the glory of their inheritance shall shine forth before them. And I'm, I'm losing my place here. Okay, the nation shall come up to worship on the mount the testifieth of the patience and the long-suffering of the servant of the Lord. And in the latter days, new tidings of the gospel shall be issued forth out of Jerusalem, and the hearts of the people shall rejoice, and behold, fountains shall be opened, and there shall be no more plague. In those days there shall be wars and rumors of wars, and a king shall arise, and his sword shall be for the healing of the nations, and his peacemaking shall abide, and the glory of his kingdom a wonder among princes. And it came to pass that certain of the Druids came up to Paul privately and showed their rites and their ceremonies that they were descendants of the Jews, Jedahites, which escaped from the bondage of the land of Egypt, and the apostle believed these things, and he gave them a kiss of peace. And Paul abode in his lodging there for three months, confirming in the faith and preaching Christ continually. And after these things, Paul and his brother departed from Raphimus and sailed to Adium in Gaul, that's Belgium. And Paul preached in the Roman garrison, and amongst the people, exhorting all men to repent and confess their sins. Now he's, already, now he's crossed back across the water. He spent about three months in England. 
And there came to him certain of the Belgi to inquire of him of the new doctrine. That's in Belgium. And who would that have been? That would have been Jews, would it not? And inquire him of the new doctrine and of the man Jesus. And Paul opened his heart unto them and told them all the things that had befallen him. Howbeit that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and they departed pondering among themselves upon the things which they had heard. Verse 18, And after much preaching and toil, Paul and his fellow laborers passed to Havilita and came to a mountain called Pontius Pilate. That's on Lake Lucerne in Switzerland. Where he came, he who condemned the Lord Jesus dashed himself down headlong so miserably and perished. Immediately a torrent gushed out of the mountain and washed his body broken in pieces into the lake. And then there's a comment. See it, it was the Palestine, Asia Minor, the pilot. He committed suicide all the way over in Switzerland. That's now, now I'm getting back. Neither Paul or Luke had been there when Pontius Pilate pulled the plug. And Paul stretched forth his hands upon the water and prayed unto the Lord, saying, O Lord God, give a sign unto all nations that here Pontius Pilate which condemned thine only begotten Son, plunged down headlong into the pit. Into the pit. You catch that. You know what the pit is. And while Paul was yet speaking, behold, there came a great earthquake, and the face of the waters were changed, and the form of the lake, like unto the Son of the Man, hanging on agony on the cross. The Son of the Man is the common term given of the Messianic prophecy delivered to come. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, here's a comment. If Simonia, if Simonia forged this document, then why would he use Son of God like any good Frenchman? That's New Testament Christianity. It's not something he would have done. He's glorifying something that took place in England, and now he's glorifying something that took place in Belgium, and then something that took place in Switzerland. He wouldn't have done that. So I'm not ratifying this. I'm throwing this out there for, for your puzzlement because I, I enjoy looking at all the history and not all history is correct and we don't know if this is correct. But it does have some handprints on it of the Lord, does it not? Uh, for the Lord to stimulate the waters, that's nothing new. For the Lord to uh, do these things, that's nothing new either. Matter of fact, it's almost the same equation of what's gone on in the book of Acts before the same thing that Peter's done, the same thing that happened in Ephesus. So uh, there is a, this plausible thing that could it could have taken place. A uh, voice came out of saying, uh, Even Pilate hath escaped the wrath to come, for he washed his hands before the multitude at the blood shedding of the Lord Jesus Christ. When therefore Paul and those who were with him saw the earthquake and heard the voice of the angel, they glorified God, and they were mightily strengthened in the spirit. And they journeyed and came to Mount Julius, where stood two pillars, one on the right and one on the left hand, and erected by Caesar Augustus. Now, they loved this area because this was their escape from the heat. This was uh, just, just uh, Switzerland, just like it was back in the, uh, in, in our day. It, it was back in their day. There was castles built all around this lake. There were ships all around it. There was garrisons around it. It was a part of the Roman Empire. It was their vacation getaway. Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, stood up between the two pillars, saying, Man and brethren, these stones which you see this day shall testify of my journey hence. And verily I say... They shall remain unto the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all nations. Now, isn't that a strange statement for him to say? Neither shall the way be hindered throughout all generations. And they went forth and came to Iltrilicum, I'm terrible with names, intending to go by way of Macedonia to Asia. Now he's in his way, final trip, back to Ephesus, and then down to a little city that's just beyond that where he was arrested his second time and sent back to Rome. And uh, Rome had been burnt right after he left when he, uh, he had been in chains. Right after he left, the city Nero burnt the city of Rome. 
He wanted to remodel it. He wanted a special place for his palace. He, he wanted to get rid of all the, uh, the, 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 the people that had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. He wanted to get rid of all the houses. He had a new public work, so he, he had the city burned himself. Matter of fact, his name means incendio. <laughs> he was a firebug for sure. Now, after he had it burned, then he began to blame it on the Christians. So right after Paul left, there began to be a great persecution on the Christians, and by this time it had grown and grown and grown. In uh, 68 AD, uh, Nero took his life uh, at the ending part, I think, of 68 AD, or maybe it was June or July of 68 AD, and I think Paul was executed right before that because there's also corresponding documents uh, referring to that they both were executed which means that they both were executed that year or in the same time zone. It was talking about Peter and Paul. They had been captured and brought there, and somewhere about 67, both of them were put to death about the same time there in Rome. But they weren't the only ones being put to death. The Christians were being put to death by the hundreds of thousands by this time. So that kind of brings you up to date about what this Acts chapter 29, whether it's a part of it or not, we don't know. But however, there's lots of historical documents and lots of witnesses that say that Paul did make that journey, both there in England and uh, there in Spain. What I find most interesting is uh, there's uh, lots of information that uh, England was uh, highly tied in with Rome. Many of the princesses of the kings of England uh, had married into the royal families of the Caesars themselves that were there in Rome. Uh, many of the, uh, matter of fact, the head of the uh, Roman guard itself had a princess wife that uh, the emperor had given him from England, one of the, the queens, or not queens, but the, the princesses of, of England. So that's generally what the Romans would do. They would take something and then they would get the kings and their families and say, look, we want the monarch to continue on, but we want a blend of the monarchs because if we blend the monarchs, you won't attack us and we won't attack you. We're one country. Do you understand that? We're one country. And if you don't want to be one country, we'll kill you. Now, do you want to be one country? <laughs> so it was a real simple rule that they had. You obeyed or you died, you know. And so they, they got lots of uh, uh, conversion that way, of people doing it their way. Now, I hope this stimulates you somewhat, because if this did take place, then the prophecy is fulfilled that Jesus gave the command that the, that the, that the word is supposed to be uh, preached to the uttermost parts of the world. That was At that time, it was the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, it was supposed to be treat, uh, preached to the lost uh, sheep of Israel. Uh, that would have been fulfilled. There's many things that would have been fulfilled if this story is true, in prophecy, and at the command of our Lord Jesus for that to be having taken place. And, of course, I could, I could fill your wagon full of prophecies, and we could get off on all that stuff. But what I would like to present to you is that the Holy Spirit was still on the move. The Holy Spirit was still conquering nations. The Holy Spirit was still giving invitation for people to come in and become a part of the kingdom of God. And after this, we see an anointing that was passed to Timothy. We see an anointing that was passed to Clement. We see an anointing that was passed to Onesimus. We see anointing. And God began and continued to raise up apostles in those days, men that could really hear him, walk with him, know him, and, of course, there were several other emperors after Nero that were ten times more vicious than Nero ever thought about being towards Christians. And the reason being is because, you remember all the temples I showed you? Those were to the Caesars, most of those were. They really thought they were gods, and they thought, you deserve death if you won't worship me. It would present a real problem if our area was conquered and they came in and built a uh, Barack Obama temple here and you had to go down and bow your knee to that Barack Obama temple. Why are you going to do that? And at the same time, you also have to renounce Jesus Christ as your God and you have to accept him as your God. Are you going to do that? Paul was in that type of situation there in that place. And I find it absolutely amazing. For two years, he continued to preach the gospel there in Rome. 
For two years, he was set right in the right center of things to be able to preach it. And from there, uh, he didn't write any books on that trip because that was a whirlwind trip of just going from place to place to place to place, preaching the gospel as much as he could. He was on a timed agenda by our Lord and accomplished much. Spain, still to this day, is a place that's really dedicated to the Lord. They really have a fear of God that most nations don't have. They have a central purpose in their heart that it's about God and about family. That's in their heritage. One of the strongest heritages I've seen is the Spanish culture and their family life and their relationship with the living God. Now, there are many of them that have gone on and become filled with the Spirit as Paul... Did you catch that? that in the last days that God would pour out His Spirit in the midst of, the, in the midst of what I was reading you. So there's some indications that there's some things from the Lord that will stir our spirit within us. Uh, it, it certainly makes it so it just doesn't end. You remember there was just an abrupt end. It was like he was interrupted and, you know, Paul may have got his marching orders, Pack! Well, I'm out of here! We're free! <laughs> and Luke's throwing all of his papers in and off he goes and we don't know if Luke went with him. We do know that uh, there's a mansion of men going with him. Well, we know John Mark was there in Rome with him. Luke was there in Rome with him. Tychicus was there in Rome with him. There was a couple of other guys that are named that were there in Rome with him while he was in prison, plus all the workers of doing the work in the church. He's still the head of the church that's there. Peter's not the first head of the church there, is he? Who, who's the head of the first church there? Dear Paul. Dear Paul. Now. Yeah. Uh, and he left somebody in charge when he, he, he left there. He always appointed. He, he, he'd think and he would pray, and uh, Lord, who, who, who is supposed to lead your people into your presence? Who's, supposed to, who's the anointed one that will teach the people how to stay in step with the Spirit and how to seek the Spirit and how to come in contact with the Spirit? I, I praise God that God uh, made arrangements to, to send Paul uh, to us as our... Uh, chief apostle of the Gentiles because his preaching today has formed and encapsulated what it's like to serve Jesus Christ. His preaching and his teaching encapsulate what true Christianity is. It wrote the bylaws of what it's like to live a life of faith. It freed us from the law and brought us under the law of the Spirit. It brought us into contact with God with our Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit and his gospel taught us that we could walk with Jesus, hear Jesus, see Jesus, be led by Jesus everywhere this man went for his whole life after he had that road meeting with Jesus. He never stopped doing the same thing over and over and over. Why? Because he had met God and he would not cease in that. He knew he deserved death I find it interesting that when he started out his journey, he, he talked about that uh, he was less than uh, the brothers and uh, that he was less than the, the, fire, the, 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 the other apostles. He was least of the apostles. And then he, he began to... He, you know what his final word was? Uh, in the middle, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm the least uh, uh, among the, the, the saints. And then at the end, he said, I am the chiefest sinner there ever was. <laughs> and, and as we move closer to our Lord, we can see, it's not to say that he was in sin, it's just we can see what we consisted of. As we move closer into truth, we can see how much we weren't in truth, and we can truly look back and say, wow, oh Lord, there was so much I needed of you then. And that was what Paul was constantly pointing out. And that's a sign of growing in maturity is that we get to see more of what was wrong with us, but we also, at the same time, wasn't Paul effectually appreciative more to the Lord of, oh, Lord, look what you overlooked. Look what you forgave. Look what you washed. Look what you cleansed. Shouldn't we get that picture too so that we would just love him and appreciate what he's done that much more as we make discoveries of those things that we have not lived up to the mark in? Jesus will help us over that mark. He puts a high, high mark up in the sky that we cannot get over 
unless he lifts us up and says, here, let me help you. And he, he drops us over the mark. Do you trust Jesus can help get you over that mark? Because when we look at the mark, it's almost impossible. But if we look at him and say, oh, Jesus, you, you, you are capable of taking me over that mark. Matter of fact, would you just hold me in your arms and just uh, get that pole vault and let, let, would you, let's do it together. <laughs> you know, I can just see him holding me in one arm and running with the pole and we both get over that. He made it over it. He made it over that high, high mark himself. He pole vaulted over it. And he offers to carry us in his bosom. That's why he wants to be inside you. If he's inside you, he can jump over it. If I'll give him my feet, if I'll give him my arms, if I'll give him my life, he can jump over it. I cannot. Shall we pray? Or there's lots to think about. And it just rings in my heart that you're on the move and on the march, that you've not stopped. You keep conquering and bringing people. There's a whole new wave of people that's never heard of you about every 60, 60 years on earth. A whole new set of people that have never heard of you. The Lord, we too want to be busy about your business. There's a new generation that's never heard of you. And shouldn't we be like Paul, willing to take it to the end of the earth? Yeah, you asked us to go anywhere. We seem like we're at the end of the earth, and we're certainly dealing with people from the end of the earth. So help us bring them to you. Help us preach the word boldly and introduce them to you who is a living God in our midst. In Jesus' name I pray.